All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so, so far in class, we've been learning about forces and kinematic equations, but what we haven't really talked about is uh, how those uh, phenomena play out in the real world. So today we'll talk about real world forces. And so what I mean by that is if you have a projectile that's flying through the air, uh, we've been assuming that only gravity was acting on that object. Uh, but in the real world, we have things like air resistance that will be slowing the object down as it travels. Or when we have something that's moving along the ground, we have a friction force that will be acting in the opposite direction of that object's motion. So uh, we'll talk about those kinds of forces today and how uh, they can fit into the framework of what we've already uh, worked on. So we'll start with friction. Well, maybe I'll just write them all down first. So we'll start with friction and that's uh, two, surfaces in contact then there's going to be drag which will be an object moving through a fluid And then as kind of a subset of drag, uh, we'll have Stokes law, which is basically drag for small objects. Or uh, in denser fluids, Then we'll talk about stress, strain, and shear, which are going to be uh, how forces can deform objects. And in physics, when we talk about fluids, we mean anything that's not solid. So fluid equals gases and liquids. So when we say an object moving through a fluid, uh, for drag, that means air resistance would count as a drag force. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll talk about friction first. And in some of your homework problems, you've kind of seen friction introduced, but 
Uh, we haven't talked about it conceptually. And those questions were like, find the magnitude of friction. Um, and to do that, you only needed to know how to set up your free body diagram. But now we'll talk about uh, a little bit more in depth of, with friction. So there are two types of friction. So there's static friction. And we'll write that as, or the way I write that is F for your force. And then a smaller F for friction. And then another subscript for static. So this is force. This is friction. And this is static. And then the other type is kinetic. So that's F with a subscript F with the subscript K. And so static means when things aren't moving. And kinetic means when things are moving. The, when we write our friction force, we're gonna use this, sub, this mu with the scripts, subscript S and then multiply that by the normal force. So this mu is the coefficient of friction. And because it has a subscript S, this is the coefficient of static friction. And then for the kinetic friction, it's mu sub K times the normal force. And so you should notice that I wrote this equation with a less than or equal to sign. And so what that means is that your friction force is only gonna be as big as the force that you're pushing with up to some maximum uh, friction force. That maximum friction force is just mu s times the normal force. Yes. Up at the top right. Uh, so, yeah, let me write it bigger. This is the maximum static friction force. And we just change that less than or equal to sign into an equal sign. Mu S times normal force. So if you imagine like a really big boulder or something, you can push on that boulder with different strengths and the boulder is still not gonna move. Uh, here, let's 
let's look at our free body diagram. So let's say I had a really big boulder. And I'm pushing on this boulder with some pushing force. F push. And we know that it's got a normal force and a gravitational force. So if this object is not moving to the left, we know that there has to be a friction force that is counteracting that pushing force. So if let's say initially I pushed F push one with 20 Newtons of force and the rock didn't move, then the friction force would also have to be 20 Newtons. Then if I pushed, I figure, okay, I'm stronger than that. I push with 100 Newtons of force and the boulder still didn't move. Now my friction force is gonna go up to 100 Newtons. So the, as long as this thing isn't moving, the friction force is going to be equal to whatever force you were pushing with up to some maximum value at which point the boulder would actually start moving. And that maximum value is determined by this coefficient of friction. So this coefficient of friction is something that you can measure in the lab. And I think in your textbook, they give you a list of different uh, coefficient of frictions between different objects. So, but it's not in the problem or something they would give you what the coefficient of friction is. Uh, typically, you would expect your coefficient of friction to be uh, between one and like zero. So we saw this kind of quick example with the uh, pushing on a flat surface. Uh, but now let's look at another example where we have an object sitting on a ramp with mass M. The ramp has some angle theta. And we notice that the this thing isn't moving just like my calculator wasn't sliding off of the table when I tilted it at an angle. So let's see if we can find what the force of friction is that will keep this thing in place. And when we find that, we can also find what the static coefficient of friction is. So the first step in these kinds of problems is to draw your free body diagram. So normal force is always pointing perpendicular to whatever surface you're sitting on. Our gravitational force is pointing straight down. And Using my prior knowledge, I know that if these were the only two forces, the block would go down the ramp this way. But since I see that it's not moving, I know that my friction force has to be pointed in the opposite direction. So now you have a choice. You can either leave your coordinate system like this. And if you did that, you would have to 
break your normal force and friction force into components. And also you would have acceleration in both the X and Y direction. So this, this situation is more complicated. What's easier is to rotate your coordinate system so that the Y direction points in the direction of the normal force and the X direction points down the ramp. So now in this new coordinate system, the box is not going to accelerate in the Y direction. And that makes sense, right? If you just had a box on a ramp, it doesn't jump off the ramp and it doesn't somehow melt into the ramp. It just stays along the surface of the ramp. So no acceleration in the Y. If this thing was moving, all of its acceleration would be in the X. And we have the added benefit that normal force is in the Y, friction force is in the negative X direction. And so the only force we have to break into components is our gravitational force. So there's a lot less math to do if you rotate your coordinate system like this. Yes. So if, if we rotate our coordinate system now, the, so gravity is pointing straight, it's, gravity is pointing straight down, and this is the x-axis, and this is the negative y-axis. So I would make a right triangle like this, such that the right angle is the angle opposite the force I want to break into components. And then using the trig stuff that we did before or the guess and check method, you'll see that this is actually the angle theta of the ramp. And so breaking our gravitational force into components, you get that the X component of gravity is FG sine theta. And then the Y component is FG cosine theta. So you can you can pick like I just I picked my x to point down the ramp because I know if there was no friction that's the direction the box would move. But you could have said that uh, you could have written your coordinate system like this instead, or you could have written your coordinate system where y is pointing this way and x is pointing this way. Is that, is that your question? So the, the nice thing about physics is we're free to pick whatever coordinate system we want. And I am picking this one because I think that it's gonna be, it's gonna make my math the easiest to do. Okay, so we've got now our X and Y components for our gravity. So if I wrote those on my free body diagram, maybe in blue, this would be the Y or the, the Y component of gravity. And this would be the X component of gravity. And so if you look at all of these forces, you'll see that there's 
two forces in the x direction that can balance each other, two forces in the y direction that can balance each other. And so this box will stay stationary and we can solve uh, for these two variables. So let's do that now. So we'll set up our, our Newton second law equation. And there's two of them because this is two dimensions. So some of the forces in the Y equals MAY. Some of the forces in the X equals MAX. So in the X direction, we had the force of gravity in the X we said was positive and the force of friction in the X was negative. And we said that those things were not moving. So if all we cared about was the force of friction, then we know it's equal to the X component of gravity, which we said was force of gravity times sine theta. And then the force of gravity is just mg sine theta. So this answers one of the questions that we had, which was what is the magnitude of the friction force? But if we want to know what the coefficient of friction is, so let's say we replace our friction force with its definition, which is mu s times normal force. So now we don't know what the normal force is. So if we wanted to solve for the static coefficient of friction, we need that normal force. We can go into the y direction to find the normal force because we know that from our free body diagram, the normal force pointed straight up, so it's positive. And then the y component of gravity pointed down, so that's negative. And then this thing isn't moving, so we know the acceleration in the y is zero. Now the normal force is equal to the y component of gravity. So the normal force equals m g cosine theta. And then right there is the mass. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so if I take this normal force and plug it in here, I get mu s is or mu s times mg cosine theta equals mg sine theta. You'll see that there's an mg on both sides, so those will cancel. And mu s equals sine theta over cosine theta, which you could rewrite as tan theta. And so using our Newton second law and our new definition of friction, we were able to find, if, if we were given numbers to plug in, we could find both the force of friction and the coefficient of friction. So conceptually, to keep in mind with friction and drag force is that both of those forces point in the opposite direction of your motion. 
So if you're moving in the positive x direction, then your drag or friction force point in the negative x direction. So any questions about this example that I just did? Okay. So now we'll move on to talking about drag forces. And this will be a force with a subscript of a D. So force of drag. And so this will be, so we said this was a force that objects moving in a fluid can feel. And then we define fluid as any gas or liquid. So uh, basically anything that's moving through the air or is on the earth that has atmosphere is going to feel these kinds of drag forces. And so the equation for drag force looks like this, one half C rho A B squared. So I'll explain what each of these variables mean. So this is just a drag coefficient. So similar to your coefficient of friction, this is something that you can measure in a lab. And if you had a problem like this, you would either be trying to solve for this or you would be given it. Uh, it's not something that you would know offhand. Rho is the density of the fluid. So again, this is something that you can look up. Uh, what is the density of air, for example? And more generally, density is the mass of something divided by the volume. So it has units of kilogram per meter cubed. A is the cross-sectional area. of the object. And I'll show an example of that in a second. And the V is the velocity. So sometimes you might see a simpler version of this where the drag force is just equal to B times the velocity squared. And then B is basically everything in front of the, the V squared part. So in a problem, you might be given each of these uh, variable separately and then you have to calculate B or they just might give you B uh, right from the beginning. Yes. Uh, this is a cube. Because volume is mass or is uh, meters cubed. So let's briefly talk about cross-sectional area. So if you haven't seen this before, um, I'll try my best to draw some good pictures. So the conceptually, this is just like, if you cut an object, 
how do I explain this? So this is the area of a slice of an object. So the, the higher math definition would be the projection of the three-dimensional space into a two-dimensional uh, plane uh, in picture form. What that looks like is if I took this sphere and I cut it with this red plane, then the cross-section of the sphere would just be a circle. And so if you knew what the radius of the sphere was, then you could calculate this cross-sectional area to be pi r squared. So similarly, if I had a, a cylinder like this, and I let's say that the cylinder was moving uh, in the direction. Uh, so if I had my water bottle as the cylinder, the flat end is the direction that it's moving in. Then again, I make my slice. And the cross sectional area would be a sphere. They're not a sphere, a circle. That's, that's. And so you could calculate the area. But if the cylinder were instead moving in the direction of the blue arrow, now if I take my cross section this way, my cross sectional area would be that of a rectangle. And if you knew the dimensions of this rectangle, length, height, then you would get the area as length times height. So in these problems, you'll probably be given either a value for the cross-sectional area or they would tell you the shape of the cross-sectional area and give you the dimensions that you could calculate what the area is. Okay. So that was for drag for a special case of drag, we have Stokes law. And so we said that this is for, uh, this is basically drag for small objects or for objects in high viscosity liquids. This viscosity term means how easy or hard it is uh, to pour something. High viscosity means that it's really hard to pour something. Um, but in any case, so this would be for things that are more dense than air. Yeah. 
Right. Um, so I think one of the examples to think about in life sciences is, for example, if a human were to fall from a really big height, they would potentially hurt themselves or die. But if an insect or maybe like a mouse fell from that same height, they would be unharmed. Uh, so there is some, uh, like there is a cutoff. I don't know off the top of my head what that cutoff is. Um, but the, the problem would say something like a small object, and that would be your clue that it's to use Stokes law instead of the drag force. And so Stokes law, the force for that is six pi r eta times v. Where this is the radius of the object. This is the velocity. And this eta term is going to be uh, now instead of the density, it's going to be a, um, so the next thing that we're gonna look at is Hooke's law. And so this governs how springs work, um, but we'll see in a second that, um, well, in physics conceptually, we treat a lot of things like springs. So this is a very important law, um, but even just in everyday life, you have things that you stretch, like say your clothing, where it stretches a little bit and then it returns back to its original shape. Uh, so that's, those are all things that would govern Hooke's law. And so in the case of a spring that looks like this, if let's say, for example, I measure the length of this spring as L zero, and then I hung some mass from the end of the spring And then I measure the new length as L or L2. Then the, the change in the length of this spring delta Y would be L2 minus L0. So the force that governs uh, how much this spring has stretched is written like this. You can, I write it as F sub S or F sub spring. You could also write it with a subscript of H for Hooke's law, but it tells you that the, whatever amount you stretched your spring by times a constant which is the spring constant K so you'll take your spring constant multiply by the amount that the string the spring was stretched by and you'll get the force acting on or that either the that's acting on the spring or that the spring is exerting on, for example, the mass that's hanging from it. So if we assumed that this mass or this spring didn't have any mass of its own, we could make a free body diagram where the sum of the forces in the Y equals MAY. If this mass is sitting stationary, then the acceleration is zero. We have the force of the spring 
is, oh, I guess I should make my free body diagram. Force of the spring, force of gravity. The force of the spring equals force of gravity, or sorry, force of gravity minus the force of spring minus force of gravity equals zero. And then we get the spring force equals gravitational force. So we've already plugged in the direction of the spring. So this minus sign uh, is not going to matter. So if you knew how much your spring stretched, then you could find this spring constant by dividing by delta y. And so in the lab you guys did yesterday where you were pulling on your springs, you saw that it had, some of you had units of mass listed on the spring. And so that was because whoever designed that uh, scale basically did this free body diagram work for you. They found out what the spring constant was and they saw that if the spring, if the spring stretched by a certain amount, uh, that would tell you how much mass that object had. So that's this is the physics behind how those uh, springs work. Some of you just had springs that showed units of force. And so it was just reading what the, instead of doing all of these extra steps, it was just saying that the spring force equals mg. And so we'll be seeing more about springs a bit later on. Um, but then one more thing to get through. So all of these things that we talked about, so we talked about things opposing your force of mo or the object that the, the direction that you're traveling in for friction and drag. Hooke's law is how kind of relates to how stretchy something is. So things that obey Hooke's law, when you stretch them, they'll eventually go back to their original position. But we know that sometimes things don't go back to their original position. So what is the physics of that? So best is when we talk about stress and strain. And the equation for this is going to look like this. And so this is one way to write it. I'm going to write it. I guess I'll define these variables. So this is delta L. This is the change in length. So the same kind of we did delta Y previously. Uh, this is delta L, just change in length. L0 is your initial length. A is your cross-sectional area. F is the force being applied. Y is called the Young's modulus. And so again, this is something that you measure in the lab. So uh, depending on the direction that the force is applied, this will be a measure of how much the object can either be compressed or stretched. And the Young modulus for stretching or compressing is different. And there's a table in your textbook that lists different materials and their respective Young moduli. Another way to write this equation is like this. So this is the same equation, the same variables. And now this term on the left, we define as the stress. So how much force you apply to the cross-sectional area of the object and delta L over L zero is the strain. 
And so that's how much the object has been stretched or compressed. And so these apply if you had like a, a string or something and you were pulling along the direction of this, the string. Um, but there's one more type of force or uh, interaction of a force in an object called shear. And so this is when the force acts uh, not along the direction of the object, basically. So if you had like a pencil and you broke the pencil in half, that would be a shearing force because you're not stretching or compressing the pencil, you're applying the force perpendicular to that. And so the shear looks like this, delta x equals one over s. So again, this is the length, the initial length. This is force and cross-sectional area. This is the amount the object will be. Uh, so this would be amount of displacement, displacement of object in the direction of the force. And this S is a measure of the, the strength of the object along the delta x direction. And so again, there's a table in your book that gives you these different S coefficients. Um, but for certain materials, they are very strong at uh, withstanding stresses and strains, but they're very weak when uh, shear forces are applied to them. So for example, like if you had a concrete wall, it's very good at having stuff stacked directly on top of it. Uh, but as soon as you, uh, for example, in an earthquake have uh, forces that cause the building to shift or sway side to side, you get shearing forces that end up breaking the buildings apart. So uh, these were some examples of how what we've learned so far can be applied to real world phenomena and uh, for the most part, we won't have too many problems that use these, uh, but so be thankful that we live in a, or in our physics class, we use kind of an idealized world where we don't have to take into account a lot of these different phenomena. But the real world is, is hard to deal with mathematically sometimes.